Today, we interview Lee Keen, championship winning Porsche pilot and the guy that gave us Wednesday's driver's eye video from the 2013 Nürburgring 24. We put his words to the visuals he captured from the cockpit of his Porsche 997 GT3R race car. Watching all the action videos on drive and knowing that my assigned role at drive is mainly sitting at this desk, turns out talking to Lee Keen was the best option for today's show. You know, also in racing, last weekend, there was the V8 Supercars at Coda. 68,000 fans, great action. Red Bull Holden, holding court. There was also Indy qualifying. Local boy makes good, but maybe soon to be chew toy of the big teams at the 500. World Touring Cars had their slow motion qualifying. And the defense of such by our friend Rob Holland over at jalopnik.com. Global Rallycross, the X Games, got washed out. MotoGP was also running the wet but they ran, Honda dominating, maybe proving that they are ready for F1 engines again. And then there was the Nürburgring 24 last weekend. But this is a Friday show, so it's a little late to pull the trigger on reporting on that stuff, which gets us to the drive on Wednesday, Lee Keen Nürburgring 24 driver's eye video, which was this year's version of our trip last year to the Nürburgring 24. So when we come back, we'll get Lee to explain his Nürburgring actions and maybe share his opinion on some other racing happenings. But you know, all in shakedown style. Lee Keen, back from Nürburgring. Thank you for joining us on Shakedown. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always good to see you. Oh, here we go with the BS. Listen, <laughs> uh, who... <laughs> You know, I, I want the viewers to know who you are. You did that great video, but who you are, other than the, frankly, the love interest of J.F. Musial, who claims he discovered you, and that's how I learned about you. Uh, and you know what? Rather than have you rip through your background, let me, let me do a little bit to put your performance in perspective and uh, make sure I get the facts right. So I think you started racing at the age of 12. You got your racing puberty a year later with your first professional win. And then we've really not accomplished much. How about this? 2009 Grand Am GT champion. 2010 Le Mans 24 P2 in GT2 class. Same year, Nürburgring class winner in a Ferrari, if I recall, for Hankook. Uh, P9 maybe overall, 2010, uh, only won the Sebring ALMS race. GT, I believe, 2011 Grand Am champion. 2012 ALMS GT champion. Did I get half of that right? Some of it, yeah. Second overall in 2010 at Nürburgring, which that was my first Nürburgring 24. And, and after doing it this year, I realized how big of a deal that actually was back, back in 2010. And then, yeah, I helped. I missed two races in GTC last year with Alex Job. Um, so we won the team championship. I was a major factor in that. Um, and I, but I actually finished second in the driver's uh, points because I had the two two miss races. My co-driver, Cooper McNeil, he won the drivers, and then we, of course, won the team championship too. So, a major part of three championships in the past four years, which has been pretty fortunate, pretty happy, pretty yes. happy. I can say that. With, without question, and in, 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 and thank you for the honesty, but in all fairness, quite a quite a racing stud. And according to the commenters on your Nurburgring driver's eye video. You have balls the size of German Zeppelins, so <laughs> you've, got, you've yeah. got all the tools? Uh, no comment on that, <laughs> but I, the, the, the comments were actually a lot, a lot of fun to read. Uh, I had a, a lot of laugh out loud moments. <laughs> yeah, well, letting him, letting him inside what you do is, is really good. So let me start with my first question, and I'm going to start with a, a, a list. Head, hands, eyes, ass, and balls. I believe these are the tools of a racer. And, and we all know some drivers where we could add the list, but I'm, not for you. But let me ask you, is that list, head, hands, eyes, ass, and balls, is that pretty much what defines what you need, what you need to manage, you know, to be a great racer? Uh, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. You need, you need all that. You need your ass to feel the car through the seat um, and, uh, of course, all the others, too. Your head is, uh, is an interesting, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not really thinking when I'm watching the video and it reminds me, oh, yeah, that did happen. You know, I was unconscious, I guess, if you will, or, or whatever. And, and a lot of the good guys, when you really get, you know, what they say, the zone, 
um, you, you just, you know, it's cliche, but you become one with the car and all that. So you're, you're actually not thinking at all. I never once thought, oh, I should break now or, oh, I need to downshift or anything like that all, all in the video. It was all just kind of subconscious, you know, going through the motions. Well, it's funny because you, you, you actually segue to my next question. Driving in the rain versus driving in the dry, does that progression of, of doing things intuitively or thinking through it, does that change? I mean, frankly, help coach up these kids that want to be racers. How does your mind work in the different condition? You know, it is different. I find myself a, a lot more focused in the rain, and that, that helps me. Um, in the dry at Daytona, when you're doing laps and laps and laps, and you know you, you get thinking about other stuff. There's an airport really close by, so you see a lot of planes taking off. I'm into planes and RC planes, so I'm checking out the planes, wondering what it is, 172, 182 maybe. During the race. Uh, in the rain, though, in, in a place like Nürburgring, you get so focused. And, and I think this is the same kind of uh, you know, focus this that you see from rally drivers and WRC and stuff, where you see that their eyes never blink or anything like that. And that's really uh, what brings out your best. That's why I love, that's why I was really fortunate to be put in um, this past weekend in the rain, in, in the night, in the harsh conditions at, at, on the Norse Life, because uh, I love moments like that where you can actually, uh, you know, it brings everything you have as a driver out of you. Well, I'm going to bounce around my list because you just, you just set up. Tell me a little bit about your role with the team your teammates and the car. This was a Porsche 997 GT3 R. Yeah, 500 a, horsepower. Yeah, it's unrestricted. Okay. These cars start off as FIA GT3 cars, and then they're kind of souped up. There's not as many rules, or the rules are more lenient in the in the Nurburgring, the VLN series. It's this, you know the series runs at, at the Norsch Life, uh, and then the big race of the year is the 24. Audi just came out with their Ultra which is, you know, the GT3 uh, R8, but then it's got different era, really trick era stuff. The SLS is, you know, all the cars are kind of, you know, souped up to the max. And you were in the top class, just to be clear. Yeah, SP9 the, is the top. S, there's like a million different classes. The SP9 class is the most competitive, and that, that is unrestricted, uh, souped up, more aero uh, GT3 cars. Yeah, now your co-drivers were Thomas Pavoda, Philippe uh, Fromweiler, and Christina Nielsen. Yes. So were, were you the heavy shoe? Were you the guy that was supposed to get it done? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was brought in kind of because I'd done the race. I'd finished on podium before. Um, and, and actually, it was some of these. It was two of them, their first endurance race. And now they had all, they're all racing in Europe in the GT3 uh, class. Yep. This was their first. And what... You know, what better endurance race than <laughs> Nürburgring 24, diving in head deep. But, uh, but yeah, I, mean, I was to get the car in the top 40 qualifying, and then I was uh, supposed to qualify the car, but actually I missed uh, the drawing. I was across the street eating lunch. Um, okay. So actually somebody else had to do the top 40 shootout <laughs> qualifying. Well, and to that point, top 40 had the blue light. People were asking about the blue light in your video. Yeah. The blue light's the most important thing. In 2010, we didn't get a blue light because there was a rain in Quali 1, and then in Quali 2, actually, the car was wrecked on the first lap. So we actually qualified like 47th or something like that, and we didn't get the blue light. Without the blue light at night, it, yeah. it was really a struggle. Um, we had a lot of close calls, but, you know, the cars, there's... 200 something cars so they see the blue light they know it's a quick car and that helps a lot okay so lee i'm all fixated on what it was like to drive and what you were feeling but visually we're watching this light show called your dashboard you know we have the blue light in the windshield that's that's marking you as one of the top 40 fast cars but take us through what all these lights going on in front of you represent and, and how you were monitoring them well the, the steering wheel is kind of blocking the shift lights, so you can't see them. But actually, the whole time, you can see it in the reflection of up top on the windshield. What you have is um, shift lights. I think they go yellow, orange, red, and then you shift the gear. Um, and then when the TC is kind of trying to do its thing or slow down the rear tires or whatever, the whole thing just goes full purple lights. 
you can actually see the, the roll bar and kind of cockpit light up, you know, behind the steering wheel when that happens. And it's coming on a lot. Uh, on the dash, you have, I think there's like a fuel reading. Uh, there's a number of some people were asking about towards the right, towards the bottom. That's just like the lap counter. So it's just counting up, uh, counting up the lap. Uh, then you have, you know, all the obvious stuff. It's in kilometers an hour, not miles an hour. There was a lot of questions about that. that. Wow, he's um, going fast. Yeah, it's not a Viron. <laughs> Um, but that's basically the biggest thing is the is the TC lights because they are you know doing their thing a lot. Oh, and, and I, I'm also pushing a button on the steering wheel that you can kind of see. You can see the headlights flashing in the mist of cars, and the the steering wheel is kind of at the bottom left, or the button is at the bottom left of the steering wheel. Hey, and by the way, I do have to ask: Do the radio guys? Does the crew? Are, were they on the button bothering you, or do you prefer it quiet? Leave me alone, and you're going I'm all I'm a really quiet guy. I don't talk yeah. a whole lot. Yeah. Um, sometimes I like to make jokes, and and I don't really, yeah, I don't like to know anything. Um, yeah. But you know, they come on and say good job. In that, in during that stint, they were telling me good job, and they were telling me when the closest car was and how far in front of me. So you know, it was one of those. I like to know how close in front of me, not the car behind me. <laughs> you yeah, know, tell me, tell me about the guy in front of me and how, how, you know, how I'm gaining on him. Not, I don't care about the guy behind me. Well, I, you, you made me feel good about my, my history. I, uh, despite all my chatty, I was notorious for holding the button down so I could just be in silence and drive. And you're right. I want to know there, not back there. So I want to rip through two questions then. Um, before I ask you about Ferrari versus Porsche, tell me a little bit about the driver's meeting because when we went to watch the Nürburgring, it wasn't carnage on parade. There seemed to be a lot of respect on track, a lot of discipline maybe on track, so that, that people weren't crashing into each other. Does the driver's meeting say, obey the blue light, or how do they guide this? Well, I mean, it is such a unique event, and, and is, it is, I don't want to say dangerous, racing's dangerous, but it, it's, you're putting it out there on the line a little bit more, for sure. Um, all the drivers, you have to do at least two VLN races, or you have to do, uh, I think, a VLN race and a driver's, Nürburgring driver's academy thing, which is like a two-day long deal. Um, everybody's pretty aware. Everybody uses the blinker. You know, blinker on the right means you're moving to the right. Don't not pass on the right kind of deal. Um, but it's, you know, it is, we're all out there, and the, the, a lot of the people do a really good job. Some of the people that or the difficult guys are like some of the slower guys in the GP in the fast classes. The, there was an incident during qualifying that was really sketchy with a, a quicker car trying to pass one of the other quick cars, but not as quick of a driver. But yeah, I mean the drivers, it's pretty. You know, you're in Germany, Germany, and Germans got everything figured out over there. So it's pretty interesting. There's 800 people in the drivers meeting, a thousand people or, or however many, and um, you know you. You have to sign in, then you have to, you can't, you can't leave afterwards the way you came in. You have to go out the front because they give you a wristband and they have, they have, they have all the TVs with all the, and there's like 10 guys up there all doing the driver's meeting at the same time. But it's all pretty serious stuff because, you know, I need that guy that I'm passing to know what he's doing, to know where I'm going and I need to know what he, where he's going. So it's pretty important stuff. So without getting into confidential details, what was the difference between driving the Ferrari? It was a 458, if I recall. Mm, uh, four, 430. Four, it was a 430, okay. 430 in 2010, yeah. Got it. it. So what was the difference between driving a Ferrari and driving the Porsche around the Nürburgring? You know, at the Nürburgring, you really drive the track more than you drive the car. Um, it's so unique. And, you know, when, you, when I first went there in 2010, factory drivers that I knew, all these guys that I looked up to, I mean, great drivers, best drivers in the world, they said, don't go 100%. Nobody, you can't go 100%. You got to go about 97, 98%. Um, so you're really driving driving the track. Uh, both the cars make incredible grip. I drive a Ferrari now in ALMS a little bit this season. Um, and I've been playing GT3 RSRs, and the GT3 R is pretty, pretty much a similar car to GT2 class in ALMS. Um, the Ferrari mid-engine, okay, so it, it's better entry. Uh, Porsche, you have the engine in the rear, so you get a little bit better exit. That's all the, the, the short of it. The, you know, everybody knows that about the Porsche. And I don't want to turn this into an infomercial, but, but the Porsche is not scary. 
it, 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 the middle of the corner is still the middle of the corner. It's just a question of where you can have your strength. A am I putting words in your mouth or, or help me explain no, this No, there's nothing people? wrong with Porsche. A lot of guys, they, they hop, if they've been in Formula or they've been into some other mid-engine cars, uh, you know, higher downforce cars, and they, people, really good drivers, P2 champions and, and things, they hop in a cup car and it's a completely different world. Um, and you know everybody says you can drive Porsche fast, you can drive any car fast. But if you look at the history of Porsche, obviously there's nothing wrong with the, the car because <laughs> they certainly have got plenty of a, a, you know won plenty of races. Um, but there is an advantage, especially in the rain, and that's what I was you know seeing in the in the in the race you know in in the video. Um, the engine in, over the rear axle, you have all this power down grip, yep. so you can use it to your you know you use it to your advantage. So let's chat about the video. Um, is there anything, you, you mentioned that it was very intuitive when you were driving, but, but take me through a little more. As you're steering this car, passing cars, racing the track, as you said, uh, give me the feeling, either your sensation in your, in your, your, your soul, <laughs> or what were you focusing on? Where were you really looking? Were you imagining the track because of visibility? Put me in the mood. Tell me, put the words behind the pictures we're watching. Yeah, well, you know, it was, it was pretty surreal. It was actually pretty calm in the car. I, you know, it's, the elements outside was really harsh. and pouring down rain, and it was messy and cold. Inside the car, um, you couldn't exactly see how hard it was raining, but at one point I did see sheets of rain on, through the headlights. Um, but it was... I knew I was doing well. I could I could sense that I was I was passing you know much slower cars, but then I came up on a on a R8, uh, you know one of the fast cars, and then I passed the car that qualified on pole, uh, the the number four R8, and then I passed uh, a, the BMW that finished on the podium, um, and every time I came across the finish line, you know I got on the radio, you know you're the quickest car on track keep pushing and I think I went from 24th to 17th or 16th and you know I would get a radio okay P18 is 34 seconds in front of you it is the black and white RSR and then halfway through that lap I would pass the car yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I knew I was doing well and when you get in you know when you get in the kind of in that, that feel for the car and in the zone and, I, and I've always loved the rain my first rain or my first professional win was in 2005 in pouring down rain at Watkins Glen. Second professional win was in 08 in the rain. Third was in 09 in the rain. I, for, for a little while, I thought I wasn't going to be able to win in the dry. Um, but I've always had a, a little bit of a knack for the, the rain. And, you know, when you get in the groove and you're just having as much fun as I was having, <laughs> it's easy to go fast. We spoke another time, and, and I think you told me a little bit about your, your early, early background. You just love doing the car control thing. When you, if that's true, which I think it was, yeah. talk to me a little bit about smoothness versus this mindset of, you know, beating on the car to make it go fast. What's the real mentality here? I mean, we've all talked about times grabbing a car by the scruff of the neck, but at the end of the day, what really goes on to go quick? Well, you know, there's a... I don't know if it's a secret. There's a trick, um, and if you can do it, more power to you. In the rain, okay, and it's pretty simple. Uh, keep the tires warm, and you can go faster. The <laughs> faster you go, the more warm the tires get, so the faster you go. So when the tires cool off, and I mean, you know, like at Nürburgring that night, they could cool off completely rock hard. You know, we're talking it was like 40 degrees and raining, so they could get really cold, and you have no grip. So what you see in the video is, you know, there's a lot of oversteer and things like in, in countersteer. And I'm really almost doing that on purpose, trying to work the rear tire to build the heat in it. If I can get a little bit of, of more heat in the rear tire, the car will push a little bit more. Then I can ask too much, if you will, from the front. And that'll kind of warm the front tires back up and then kind of work the rear tire. And so the, the whole thing is all about managing, keeping as much heat in the in the tire as, as possible and that's always been my trick or secret in the rain and you know it, it's if you can do it I, I say go for it well now I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna profess honest naivete 
on a rain tire, is there more slip angle in what you're working, or is it that same margin of being precise? No, there's a, well, there's a lot less grip. You know, where you see less grip, you see more slip angle. Okay. So if you think F1 or you think rally, okay? So there is a lot, um, a lot more slip angle, and there's the, the line is of traction is, is lower, so you go through it and, and the car will oversteer or, or push uh, much, much easier. What do, you, what do you learn about a car in the rain? I mean, were you working on setup in effect as you went through that stint or prepared for the rain? Or, or how does that translate into? Well, you, you got to make a car comfortable, the, mo the most important thing. Um, and we had an extremely, I got to say, to, to the Fahnbacher racing team. And Horst Fahnbacher runs, you know, he runs the team. He's the main engineer, and he's one of the best in the world. There's no doubt about that. And he's got many, many wins. Um, and he, you know, gave me an extremely comfortable car to race with. I had complete confidence in the car. I knew what it was going to do at any moment. Um, and you can have a car, you know, that's not, that's not going to do that for you. So that's obviously extremely important too. Without sounding naive, tell me about the Nürburgring 24. You know, how and why is this work for you? Why is this a race you wanted to do? Well, you know, in a way, it's the biggest race, endurance race in the world, or the biggest race in the world, because, you know, my world is endurance and sports car racing. Uh, Le Mans, I've done that twice, uh, finished on podium there, like we talked about, and it's just as big, but but different. And if somebody said, you know, I, I gotta, uh, I can either do the go to the ring, or I can go to Le Mans, or if a driver said, you know, I, I can drive Le Mans, or I can drive the ring, I would say flip a coin, because, you know, e either one of them is going to be, is going to be, you know, the most amazing experience in your life. Do you feel, how do I word this? Do you feel different pressures in different venues and different races? Um, yeah, I usually, I usually get pretty amped up before the, the Nürburgring and before Le Mans. Uh, pre, I was really wound up actually at, at before Le Mans in 2011. Why uh, was that? Why was that? I guess because we'd been there before, we'd done good, so maybe I had high expectations again. Yeah. Um, and in Nurburgring, I didn't do in 2011 or 2012, but then you know, obviously did this past weekend, and it's my first one, 2010. And like I said, I didn't even realize how big of a deal it was. Uh, so, you know, during the race uh, this past weekend, I was thinking, me and my dad were talking we're like. We finished on podium here in 2010. We didn't even know what we did. What we did. It's like impossible to do, basically. <laughs> back to the video. Um, I asked the question. I'm going to kind of go back to it. Where were you looking as you were kind of plowing through this rain? Were you focusing on particular things, or were you using the mental imagery that you recall from where the track should be to kind of negotiate this place? Well, it was nice when there was a car that wasn't, you know, terribly slow in front of me, so I could watch the car's taillights through, you know, a couple of corners to see exactly where he went. Um, granted, they're on the right line and going the right direction. <laughs> Don't follow him into the woods. <clears throat> One thing that I said is when I got behind the car, uh, the, the spray would actually fog up the windshield. Um, so I only had a certain amount of time that I could stay behind a car until I couldn't see anything at all. I'd e either have to back off or just make a move and pass him. And I was able to get by most of the cars pretty quick, but that BMW that I was talking about that finished on podium, he was, that car was a pain to get by. I think it took me about half a lap. We were fighting like mad with that car. Well, and I was watching lap times a little bit, and if I get it somewhat wrong, bear with me. I mean, you guys were running in the, the, the 830s and 840s. Uh, I think it was Maxime and that Z4 at the end was turning like an 822, so the car was quick. But in conditions, you seem to have the, the upper hand. Yeah, in, in, the, in the conditions, you know, we, the, our car was very, very good. Cool. Uh, in, in the SLS was on uh, Dunlop rain tires, and they seemed to be pretty good, too. Actually, they were better in the rain uh, relative to themselves as, as in the dry. I think that's one reason they did so well. So let me transition to a more general question about racing. Obviously, we've talked about the Nürburgring 24 being this, this mega event. And, and we've got things coming up like the um, Isle of Man TT for motorcycle. There's the Baja races and, and all these big things. And I'd even throw in there that everyone looks at th something like the Indy 500 as a mega event. But to you, 
what defines a real race? I mean, you mentioned danger earlier, and I'm not going to negate that, but what, what makes a real event a mega race? A mega race. Yeah, I mean, you got to have it all, right? Danger, speed. Um, my favorite events, uh, you know, are the 24 of Ring, Le Mans. Uh, Monaco Grand Prix is coming up pretty soon, isn't it? That's pretty cool. You know, not one of my favorites, but very obviously a big deal. Um, I think I'm most excited about what's going to happen here at uh, Pikes Peak coming up. That's the I've one never I forgot to there. mention. I've always wanted to go there. Um, and what Joe and Loeb and Red Bull are doing is I'm pretty excited to, just to see, you know, what all is going to go down there. Would you ever want to do that? I think you just said you did. Oh, yeah. I would love to do that event. I've never done a hill climb or anything, but, you know, the one lap deal that I do every year is you don't get to see the track that much. Um, you go to tracks you've never been before, so and you kind of got to go all out. And you're, you know, with a high horsepower car on street tires, so relatively low grip compared to how much horsepower you have, uh, which is similar to... Hill climb, I guess. You could so say. I'm going to be the prima donna about you know racing versus one lap, not to negate it, but refresh everyone. I think you've won this two or three times. Four times. Four times. There you go. Which car were you in this year? I was in Top Speed Motorsports Nissan GTR. Oh, so you know, just a pig, just a freaking pig. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. And and tell me a little bit about racing that event versus you know, what you just did. How did, did you approach it any differently? Mm. Or is driving, driving, Leo, and just shut up and watch me steer? For me, driving is driving kind of deal. I try not to think as like less, least amount as possible. I just drive. Uh, but that, that event, I love doing it. It's one of the, it is a true endurance event. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the longest endurance event. I mean, it's a week long. Uh, it's 4,000 miles and you cover, you know, six, seven different racetracks. We went to Daytona this year. We went to VR. We went to little tracks that you've never, heard of and you'll never even go to um, and it rains in the morning uh, you're in different conditions uh, so and it really kind of you know tunes my skills a little bit uh, I, it makes me a better driver that's one reason I, I want to do it every year does does racing in the rain polish your your car control skills and is it something you t transfer into when you drive in the dry or racing in the rain polishes your skills because it's ever changing so you know that same turn the next lap has you know 20 percent more water in it or either somebody put some mud on it or put some dirt so there's always something changing you don't have that set amount of grip that you know the car has so that's when your car control you know you rely on the seat of your pants and, and all on your car control to get you through there so here come the closing questions. I've been way too nice to you. A little bit of controversy. I need some, I need some attitude and opinion from you. And I'm going to start with this. So what do you think about things like DRS and tire degradation and all these tricks to make the show of racing? Where's your head on this? Yeah, I was reading about that. You know, we have, in Grand Am, we have some of that going on with the tire and everything. Um, and it, it has made things interesting. I went to a DTM race. They have D DRS now. I went to a Brands Hatch DTM race uh, last year, and it was really cool until the race started. <laughs> then once the race started, it was, yeah. you know, it was they're just driving around in a line. So they have DRS now, so that, that at least they can make passes. Um, I love F1. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. I, I, I like all the controversy that goes on and okay. there's more controversy than just the tax, you know? So it's just part of the deal over there. Um, but I, you know, I, I like it. Okay. Um, from the driver's seat, from the throttle pedal, I don't ever want to be conserving tires though. But if I'm watching on TV. Sure. Yeah. I, it's a whole nother show as we learn what, what, without sounding arrogant, what, what I've been suggesting all along that these F1 guys aren't racing. They're racing to a set time. And there's a lot of margin left in the car because they're managing tires. Am I yeah, right? I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot we don't know yeah. about that's going on there. Um, there's a lot, you know, in our, in my racing world that the, the fans, when they're watching on TV, that don't know what's going on. So in F1, it's got to be even tenfold of that. So who knows? Second question. Did you see the World Touring Car qualifying uh, thing where they all went slow motion? Oh, where everybody was slowing down yeah. and everything like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a draft deal because the cars have such low horsepower. 
you know, and the organizers were all uh, upset, but I think ultimately it's the organizers' fault for creating the situation. I, I don't know. So give it makes me, sense for drivers. I mean, I understand. I don't want the guy drafting. We do it at Daytona, too. Yep. Um, you know, try to get it tucked behind a car for qualifying, but if somebody gets behind you, forget about it. So not to put you on the spot, I, I'm not trying to create false controversy, but from a driver's point of view, what would you have done in that scenario? I mean, my mind, to be honest, went to, okay, if I'm sitting in P10, how the hell should I figure out the time left to find my teammate and let us go try to put a lap in here to get better. I would have just gone. The right. guy that ended up qualifying on pole, yeah. you know, I guess just went in because everybody else got penalized. I would have just gone. Okay. Uh, it's thinking, like I said, I don't like to think too much. I just got it. Okay, so Lee, here comes my last question, and I'm going to stay with the, the attempt of controversy. There's this game called Marry, <laughs> Kill. And I give you three names of people, and you decide which one you want to do whatever with. I'm going to do the racing version using three races coming up this weekend. And for Mary, it's going to be respect. For the F word, it's going to be drive. And for the uh, ignore, kill, it'll be ignore. So the three races are Indy, Monaco F1, and the NASCAR 600 race. Respect, drive, ignore, marry, kill. Which one would you want to do what to who? Yeah, OK. Um, that's pretty easy. Good. For me, I guess if I maybe I shouldn't say that, but respect the the indie, of course, I respect it. The guys, Townsend, my co-driver, he's uh, he's qualified in there. He's doing it. He's done it many years in the past. I'll be watching him. But I've been to Indy. Uh, it's it's not that extreme of a banking, you know, and it's four corners, not big Daytona, you know, big loop deals. I mean, to drive those cars at the speeds, you know, I got a lot of respect for those guys. I don't think I would want to do that i will drive flat out in the rain at nurburgring and almost crash every turn but i don't think i want to do an indy car around uh in, in, in you know, indianapolis um yeah the nascar or whatever ignore thing sorry that was i grew up in georgia boy. i'm living in atlanta and i'm a good old southern boy but um and then drive monica you know, I would love to drive Monaco. I'd love to do Monaco in the Super Cup race that's before the F1 race and then watch the F1 race. That would be my ideal setup for that. Thank you for plowing through that bad question of mine. Do you want to leave the audience with any comment about that driver's eye Nürburgring video? What do you want people to take away from watching that? You know, I'm happy to show, um, you know, my what I see. It's to the people and the fans. All, I'm a big car guy. You know, I love this stuff just like everybody else. So it's cool to kind of for me to, to share with everybody, you know, what, what's going on in the car. And sometimes, you know, for some people, they kind of need to know what's going on in the car. Well, so. I, love, I love the comments because you're, you're bringing them reality versus their perception of, of what racing a car is like, what you do for a living there. So, um, you know, I didn't want to ruin the vibe of the visuals, but I just wanted people to have a chance to meet you a little bit and understand what was going on when they were watching the cool things you were doing. So thanks for your time. Don't stay on that couch too long. When am I going to see you next? Which race again? Um, hopefully Lime Rock ALMS if you're, if you're there. Oh, down the street. Yeah, we'll be there. So hopefully that one. All right. Um, you know I look up to you out of res respect, not just your damn physical height. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for showing up on this, and uh, we'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks a lot, dude. We'll see you.